here today with Ed Kane, who's a professor of finance at Boston College, um, and also one of our inaugural INET grantees with a very fascinating and very relevant project um, called Measuring Systemic Risk. Um, welcome, Ed. Um, Thank you. Well, so what, what, are, what are you trying to do with this project? Well, there's, there's a lot of elements. First, to, to define systemic risk uh, in a conceptually sound way. Authorities have typically t talk about it as the, the risk of a crisis, a risk of, of uh, multiple institutions getting in trouble and imposing ultimately costs on taxpayers to come in and give them uh, credit support. And the assumption has been that somehow this is done in produced entirely by the financial industry by its making uh, mistakes or uh, aggressively taking risks. But it's also produced jointly with, with the federal authorities who stand ready to rescue them. The people understand now that authorities are really fearful of stepping in and imposing losses on counterparties, the people that lend to the financial institutions or who write swaps with them. And this means really that the ultimate measure of systemic risk is uh, how much taxpayers are potentially on the risk on the hook for. So, so you're measuring the moral hazard in a way. In a way, if that's yeah. what you want. It's, it, yeah. it, it's, we call it a contingent claim that if the institution gets in trouble, it, the taxpayer steps up. And uh, you can think of it as a form of insurance and that it, there would be a premium that should be paid for providing this insurance. Mm -hmm. And the uh, taxpayers ought to have collected that. So when authorities are saying today that, uh, well, most of the money's been paid back, so taxpayers didn't lose a thing, uh, that's very offensive to an economist because the opportunity cost of this credit support is this insurance premium. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that even just in the year 2009 alone, it, it was probably worth to the large banks uh, and banking organizations, since many of them are holding companies, um, something on the order of $300 billion. $300 billion? Yeah. And you're saying those are premiums that the banks would have to pay if they were buying this insurance, but it was given them for free. It was given them well, for free, although they've had to take a little heat for it sub <laughs> subsequently in the press. Politically. But they, yeah, politically and uh, yeah. re reputational heat. Yeah. But I think they're very comfortable with that as opposed to losing their jobs. Now, this way of calculating the uh, insurance premium, the, uh, for, or, or, or to look at the other way, the amount of risk, right. um, comes from modern finance. Yes, it, it begins yeah. with work by Robert Merton, who's won the Nobel Prize for this the kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so it's, it's just a contingent claims model. It's tweaked a little way as, uh, since he first developed it to, to allow for the fact that people aren't closed right away as soon as they get to be insolvent. And we use a very, very well-known, well-established model to, to estimate this. Mm -hmm. And the, the real issue is getting the data all together and, and, and running this uh, uh, procedure. And it, it's just an understanding that it is a good measure of systemic risk. It can provide some early warning. It could provide more early warning if you have better data coming from the firms. But it provides a little early warning, but it also provides a good measure of how you're going through the crisis and what would be fairer to taxpayers. Clearly this research is uh, stimulated by the financial crisis that we've been through. Is this sort of measure that you've come up with, is this something that could be used by policymakers um, in the new, in FSOC or the Office of Financial Research? That's or? of course one of our purposes. Yeah, that, okay. uh, we, it can be used in two ways. First, even the way we do it, we tease this information out of the stock prices of banking firms. Mm -hmm. But you could also to have more help from them in teasing it out of their own portfolio. They have a better idea, and they can, if they try to do this, report this number to the, to the government. And you mean I, the banks themselves? The banks themselves. So you could require the banks themselves and that, to calculate. And I believe we should. I, that yeah. I think that we've got to rethink the relationship between taxpayers and financial institutions. Taxpayers are essentially implicit stockholders, and they're in for the worst part of the ride. So the downside, the, the deep downside, the deepest downside. I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you've been uh, watching and studying and uh, involved in the banking system for uh, a long time. Let's put 50 it there. years, roughly 50 years, give or take, um, take a couple more years. <laughs> 
And um, there's been you've seen a lot of change in that have, in that yes. time. So banking has been your field the entire time. Um, initially, I was a macroeconomist okay. with an interest in banking. I discovered more and more that I really enjoyed finance generally more than macroeconomics. The things that bother me about macroeconomics is that it's almost like a religion that people decide they'll agree on certain assumptions that they're okay, they'll use them, and everyone uses them until they're found to be uh, inappropriate. And it's very hard to publish papers in that area that w mess with different assumptions, mm -hmm. whereas in finance, uh, you're much closer to what's going on. It's a matter of how individual firms are behaving and you can figure out the incentives and, and uh, really get at the, what's going on. So you started life as a more of a macroeconomist. You have a, a PhD from MIT. Yes. Um, and who did you work with there? Uh, well, uh, Samuelson, Solo, FZ Domar, Kerry Brown, and um, the, um, yeah, that, that's, those are the main ones. Uh, Kindleberger, Charles Kindleberger was a very a close mentor. And his manias, panics, and crashes. Yes, we have had some wonderful discussions, he and I, that yes. he served in government service in the State Department uh, and helped to write the Marshall Plan. And so he has uh, what I called a very starry-eyed view of government service <laughs> mm -hmm. because he was so devoted and the people he worked with were, were so on target for what they were doing. And he Reconstruction had, after World War II. Yes, and, and he found it very offensive when I was saying that you know the uh, the various federal regulators have their own bureaucratic interests, the people at the top of these agencies have their own career interests and other personal interests perhaps, uh, and and that uh, the model of just uh, officials coming down to Washington to do good for for citizens and taxpayers. Is a, as I say, just a little too rosy. And so we fought about it for a long time. And he finally agreed just before he died that uh, things weren't what they used to be. <laughs> but that was a great uh, 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 consoling thing for me because it was upsetting to see him uh, be upset by using these assumptions. He said, they just aren't assumptions he liked to see used. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, it sounds like you have a jaded view, um, but it comes from actual yes, experience. I, I argue very strongly that uh, yeah. actually I'm an idealist and a realist, um, that when I began my career, my first paid job as an economist was a, as an intern at the Federal Reserve Board. And I came in as starry-eyed as uh, Charles Kindleberger, <laughs> but uh, I saw some things going on there which um, you know, they were small things, but they were misrepresentations of uh, the way certain legis things, certain potential legislation would affect the Federal Reserve and the economy. And uh, I saw staff members that I helped, uh, I, I had a very low job on it, prepare position papers, and then see them torn up and, and uh, replaced by sheer propaganda. Yeah. And so uh, maybe just to close, this, uh, are we doing enough to make sure it doesn't happen again? Um, what, are you, what are your views um, on, on, on that? Well, we're not doing enough, and that's why I feel if, unless we get a metric that can be used to measure properly this risk and then take action to deal with it, we're just going to actually induce innovations that, whose main advantage is, to the banks is to get around the rules. So, for instance, right now they're talking about, as they did in the past, having uh, control uh, um, on the capital ratios, the net worth ratios of the firms. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble with that is if you just control the net worth ratios, no matter how you weight the, the bottom of the ratio, uh, you encourage people to take more risk in other ways. And some of it is by putting debt off balance sheet or finding other ways in another organization that you're connected with. You do uh, develop, uh, develop new instruments that authorities don't understand right away and tell the authorities, oh, those aren't risky, they, they're, they're just fine. And then they discover they're not. Um, well, we're very interested in, uh, in, in, in learning more about how to measure systemic risk and what those measures tell us about the relationship between the public interest and the private interest um, in, in the American economy um, and, perhaps in, and perhaps globally um, as, we, as, as going forward. This is exciting new research and we're glad to be supporting it. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.